Welcome everyone to our webinar, The Gap in Healthcare in Ontario, What is Needed and How That Gap Increases Falls, facilitated by, by the Fall Prevention Community of Practice. My name is Mariel Ang and I am the Project Coordinator at the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. ONF supports the Fall Prevention Community of Practice and its online platform called Loop. Loop is a place where fall prevention practitioners connect. Visit us at www.fallsloop.com. Marguerite Thomas also joins us on the line. Marguerite is the coordinator for the Fall Prevention Community of Practice. She will be co-presenting in this webinar and assisting with facilitating questions in the chat box today. Before we begin, I'm going to give you a quick rundown on the Level 3 meeting system. This webinar technology consists of two parts. The audio is provided through a telephone conference line and the visuals are provided through a web platform. The phone number for the conference line and the link to the web platform were sent to you by email after you registered for the webinar through Level 3. If you have questions about the technology at any time during this presentation, please type them into the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. Alternatively, you can email me at mariel at onf.org and I will work with you to resolve technical issues as soon as possible. This webinar will contain opportunities for participation. There will be online polls throughout the presentation, which you will answer directly on your screen. There will be a video during this presentation, so please adjust the volume directly on your computer in order to hear the video. The presenters will notify you once the video is being played, and there will be a question and answer period at the end. If you have topic-related questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box. During the Q&A, questions will be read aloud to the group and the presenters will respond. The webinar is being recorded and a YouTube video link will be sent to all participants in about one week along with the presentation slides. I would now like to introduce our presenters, Marguerite Thomas, Anna Rusak, and Sue Hochu. Marguerite Thomas has worked in injury prevention since 1996, primarily as a public health nurse, currently as the coordinator of the Fall Prevention Community of Practice with the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. Marguerite was also a caregiver uh, for somebody who lived the dental issue caregiving experience. Anna Rusak graduated from the University of Toronto's Master of Public Health program with a specialty in health promotion in 2005. Since then, she's worked at the Halliburton Corsa Pine Ridge District Health Unit as a health promoter supporting the oral health department and has been the coordinator of the Ontario Oral Health Alliance since its inception in 2007. Sue Hochu is a registered dental hygienist who graduated from Durham College in 1979. After working in private practice in Ontario and British Columbia, she began to work at the Halliburton Cortha Pine Ridge District Health Unit in 1984 until her retirement from there last year. Sue is a member of the Oral Health Advocacy Groups, the Northumberland Oral Health Coalition, and the Ontario Oral Health Alliance. Without further ado, I'm going to leave it to Marguerite Thomas to take it away and she will begin our presentation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. On behalf of Anna, Sue, and myself, we are very pleased to share information on this very important topic with you. Oral care for all, and for older adults in particular, is very near and dear to our hearts, and we hope to share our passion with you and to give you resources for action. A big part of my motivation comes from the story of my own mother, who passed away in 2016 at age 97 and a half. So I'm going to start the presentation by asking everyone, what do you think about oral health in falls? Is there a connection? Please take a moment to fill out the poll. Thank you. It looks like we have quite a few who do see a connection, quite a few who say maybe. 
So my next question to you is, what do you think about other people? Do you think other health care workers see an obvious connection between oral health and falls? I see we have a large number here who think no, that other healthcare workers do not see uh, a strong connection between oral health and falls. I hope that we will arm you with enough information to move them into that line of thought when we finish the presentation. So now I would like to tell you about my mom. This is a picture of my mom in her 80s, and you can see she was a very healthy looking older adult. She was healthy, and she was very involved in her family and community, and she had a rich and full life. Then in 2009, she had a fall and damaged several teeth in and around her dental bridge. It was the start of a downward spiral. We did get her dental appointments and paid for that part of her oral care. However, after that episode and another fall, and her increasing arthritis, it was very difficult for her to do daily self-care. She went to residential care and then to long-term care. Her weight went from around 155 pounds to close to 130 pounds as her ability to chew food diminished. She needed daily help to brush and clean her teeth, and the quality of that help was not always optimum. We continued with dental appointments for her, getting a full upper denture, and we also had a dental hygienist come to her room to clean her teeth. However, she needed consistent and quality care on a daily basis, and that, that really did not happen. She grew increasingly more frail and had more falls as her oral health declined. Yes, of course she was growing older, but her life could have been so much healthier with good oral care and the ability to chew food better. So how is poor health linked, poor oral health linked to falls? Well, let's go back to what can happen when there is poor oral health. Obviously, it can lead to poor dentition. The ability to enjoy and chew your food is not only a pleasure, it's needed for optimum nutrition. Without it, we get poor nutrition, which can lead to frailty, muscle wasting, a lack of motivation to exercise, and increased fall risk factors. Can we link oral health and well-being then? Well, I read many articles to find evidence of the link, and this non-systematic review will be shared with you after the presentation. The conclusion to this slide here is that the oral health status of many older adults is generally deficient. It's compromised. There are more cavities, gum disease, and problems of chewing. And they also concluded that all of us who care for older adults and provide their care should make this a priority. There is more literature to make these connections. And you can see the article titles here showing the differences between poor oral health and general well-being. We do have some agencies who are very helpful. They have designed the programs for oral care for older adults. The education tools are there, but we also need the staff skill, commitment, and the time to make it happen. Perhaps the biggest issue is the amount of time allotted for each resident in long-term care. Good oral care does take time, and this is on top of all the other needs that the residents have. So who else is working to obtain improved older care for adults? Well, I'll just turn it over to Sue and Anna. Well, thank you, Marguerite. I'm Sue Hoshu, 
and I'm Anna Rusak, and we are here today representing the Ontario Oral Health Alliance, or UHA for short. Please help. My mother is 65, has a limited income, and is in a lot of pain because of her teeth. She needs to have her teeth removed. Please respond and let me know if there is help for her. As coordinator of UHA, this is an example of the types of emails that I receive from Ontarians looking for help accessing dental care. In Canada, a person can walk into a hospital emergency room and get treatment for an infection in every other part of their body except for their mouth. And this is because our healthcare system does not cover the cost of dental care. 17% of Canadians avoid the dentist due to the cost of treatment, and those with the greatest need for dental treatment also have the hardest time accessing the care they need. And the mostly private model of dental care delivery in Canada isn't working for everyone. The problem is only getting worse. Now, with even middle-income groups being affected and not being able to afford private dental care, as employer benefits decrease, and as people lose their benefits as they retire and as the senior population continues to increase. These are just some examples of mouths or, or the oral cavity that uh, as oral professionals we see. And I see from the attendants we have a lot of uh, oral health professionals, which is awesome, but this is very familiar to us in a sad way. We know poor oral health not only causes pain and infection in the mouth, it impacts other areas of the body as well. And while it affects a person's ability to properly chew their food, as Marguerite has mentioned, it also impacts their ability to speak clearly and affects their appearance and self-esteem. However, as mentioned, treatment for oral problems is not an option for many Ontario residents. So how is this fair? The pictures here are um, just to illustrate the differences depending what part of the body that uh, we are talking about. The picture on the right and left of the slide shows inflammation in two different parts of the body. The picture of the leg, I can get use this one because actually it's my husband. Uh, he so graciously volunteered to let me use his picture. Uh, one week after he had a knee replacement, we noticed that redness was starting on his leg. He went to the local walk-in clinic and then was sent to our local ER, hospital emergency room, where he was diagnosed with cellulitis. At that time, he received at least three rounds of intravenous antibiotics, and even after that, had the Victoria Order of Nurses come into the house to follow him up at home. He made a full recovery from this, and OHIP covered all the costs. However, the picture on the right shows an individual with periodontal or gum disease. Research has found that when measured, and that's what the picture in the center is showing when you go for your checkups and they do a lot of the probing, it's to determine the health of your teeth and gums, the inflammation of periodontal disease can be equivalent to the size of the skin on an arm that extends from the wrist to the elbow, very much similar to the same size as the redness on the leg. However, treatment for this is not covered under OHIP, so if the person has no or inadequate insurance and cannot afford to pay, this disease will continue to progress. Next, we'd like to share with you a short video that summarizes the problem of access to primary oral health care in Ontario. Please ensure your volume controls are set to their highest levels for this video. There's a gap in our healthcare system. There are a lot of ads with images of beautiful smiles that encourage us to visit a dentist regularly. But what if you can't afford a dentist? OHIP pays to treat infections in every part of our body, except our mouth. Paying for dental care is tough for low or even middle income people in our communities. Our most vulnerable, low-income seniors, low-wage workers, newcomers, and Indigenous peoples have the highest rate of tooth decay, pain, and gum disease, but struggle to access dental care in Ontario. Poor oral health such as gum disease, tooth decay, and painful teeth affects overall health. 
This affects the ability of people with diabetes to manage their disease. It's been linked to low birth weight and preterm babies, and other conditions such as cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. It can lead to poor nutrition, affect self-esteem, and the ability to get and keep a good job. Seniors with poor oral health can have trouble socializing and remaining independent. There are a limited number of programs available. Even then, many people have trouble finding a dentist who will accept public programs or face long wait lists. The bottom line is there are no provincial dental programs for low-income working adults and seniors, including those living in long-term care. Some public health units and community health centers have dental treatment clinics, but not everyone is eligible or has one in their community. People have to then turn to their local emergency room for relief from pain. Hospital ERs are not equipped to treat dental diseases. People can only get an antibiotic, painkiller, or a referral to a dentist they can't afford. It's a big problem that costs us all. Every nine minutes, someone goes to a hospital for a dental problem, equaling almost 61,000 emergency room visits in 2015. This adds up to at least $31 million annually. Every three minutes, someone goes to their doctor for a dental problem, equaling almost 222,000 doctor visits in 2014. This adds up to at least $7.5 million. In total, the lack of access to affordable dental care is costing taxpayers at least $38 million annually in a system that provides no treatment for the problem. In 2014, the government promised to extend dental programs to low-income adults by 2025. The Ontario Oral Health Alliance thinks this is too long to wait when people are suffering from painful dental diseases now. Support the Ontario Oral Health Alliance's call for our provincial government to invest in a public oral health care program. Help close the gap in our health care system and add your voice to the call for our government to ensure accessible, affordable and equitable access to dental care for all Ontarians. So as you can see, there is a very significant gap in health care in Ontario when it comes to oral health. So this slide summarizes or reviews what was mentioned already in the video um, around what oral health programs are available for Ontarians. So this will be for your reference. And here is another review of what we just heard in the video. So as stated, as a result of there being no provincial dental programs available for adults in Ontario, many have no choice but to turn to the healthcare system for help, where every nine minutes someone in Ontario goes to the hospital ER with a dental problem, and every three minutes someone in Ontario visits their family doctor for a dental problem at a minimum of $513 per emergency room visit and $33.70 for a doctor's visit, the price take for this Band-Aid solution is at least $38 million a year for the provision of antibiotics, painkillers, including potentially addictive opioids, but no dental treatment. Although not entirely straightforward, UHA is advocating for this money to be redirected into the current public dental programs run through local public health units and community health centers, where the cost of one emergency room visit could pay for an adult to access dental treatment or at the very least access preventive dental care. Here are the dental-related emergency room visit stats broken down by age. We've highlighted the senior population numbers. They are lesser than the adult numbers, but this may be due to a number of factors, such as not being able to leave their homes, less number of natural teeth, an increased number of dentures, 
lack of recognition that a healthy mouth is necessary for a healthy body. We are focusing on seniors today, but we wanted to relay the message that if something doesn't change for the general adult population, and if equitable access to dental care for all ages is not improved, then the risk of falls will only continue to increase as our population ages. Please help. I am constantly in pain. Sharp pains through my mouth and head, constant headaches. I can only take Tylenol to help with the pain as anything stronger affects my ability to care for my children. Any information you could provide would be greatly appreciated. So as a result of hearing these stories many, many times and working with a lot of the residents of Ontario who were experiencing this, Groups of concerned citizens across Ontario formed together to try to see what we could do to help people in our communities. Over time, we became aware as groups that there were other like-minded um, groups across the province, and it, would, it became obvious that we would be stronger if we had a united voice. Thus, in 2007, UHA was formed. Our mission is to promote access to oral health programs that are currently available, such as Healthy Smiles Ontario, Ontario Works, and the Ontario Disability Support Program, ODSP. Another way of our mission uh, to promote is to help people connect with and promote the limited services that all are already available in their community. As Anna has mentioned, she receives emails all the time from people around the province. We also advocate for the improvement of oral health programs for children and to advocate for the expansion of provincial oral health programs for low-income adults and, of course, to include seniors. And in case you're not aware of it, there is no universal dental program for residents of long-term care facilities. Our vision, we want a system that allows for equitable access to oral health care for all Ontarians. So we're pleased to say that access to dental care has received a lot of attention lately and continues to receive a lot of attention during this election time. One of UHA's latest advocacy movements was a dental petition campaign that started in the fall of 2016, supporting the need for the Ontario government to speed up its promise to expand dental programs to adults by 2025. This was a Liberal budget promise made in 2014. UHA members from across the province have been working hard since the launch of this petition campaign, collecting signatures and presenting petitions to MPPs. These petitions have succeeded in getting the message out about the problem. At least 39 members of provincial parliament have been reached and dozens of petitions have been tabled at legislature. This is an article that ran last year in the Toronto Star. An ER doctor, Dr. Hassan Sheikh, who was also a guest speaker at our recent UHA forum at Queen's Park in March, opened up about the challenges he faces when he sees yet another person come through the emergency room with a dental-related issue. According to Dr. Sheikh, when someone who has been in debilitating pain due to dental infection for months or even years presents themselves to him, Advil or Tylenol is just not enough. In several CBC radio interviews since and at our forum, Dr. Sheikh talked about his concern of there being a link between prescribing painkillers at the ER for dental issues and the current opioid crisis. Another success for UHA this past year was the CBC show The Current dedicating an entire hour-long episode to dental care in Canada in November. This is a woman, a freelance writer, named Brandy, who was featured on the program. She explained that because she has so many cracked and broken teeth that she's resorted to creating her own makeshift crown out of a product called Friendly Plastic. At least two listeners called in right after the show to offer to pay for Brandy's dental work. As generous as this was, UHA believes that Ontarians shouldn't have to rely on volunteers to treat their oral health problems. Overall, the response from listeners was described by the show's producer, producers as an unprecedented outpouring of comments. Many listeners were shocked and surprised that this type of dental care need was not covered within our healthcare system. 
Since then, Brandy has received the dental care she needed as a result of the generosity of a dentist who heard her story and donations from several listeners. Brandy was also a guest speaker at UHA's forum. In late 2017, a report from the Ministry of Community and Social Services came out called The Income Security, A Roadmap for Change. Some great recommendations regarding expanding access to dental care to adults on social assistance and those with low incomes were included. The report makes the recommendation to expand the Healthy Smiles Ontario program to adults aged 18 to 65 and, adds, and add dentures as part of the benefit. It looks like this was an oversight where an assumption was made that seniors 65 plus get dental care covered, which of course they do not. UHA did send a letter to the Minister of Community and Social Services to remind her that seniors 65 plus need dental care too. Here are some photos from our recent forum at Queen's Park in March. Top left is Brandy showing a picture of her mouth before her dental treatment. Top right is Dr. Shake, ER doctor, and bottom center is a photo of Sue, my co-presenter, who, who was our wonderful MC that day, moderating a discussion between MPPs from all three parties who were asked to talk about what their plan, party planned to do to fill the gap of access to dental care in Ontario. The forum took place a few days after the NDP announced their plan to provide a dental program for all, including for all seniors, if elected in June. So, moving forward, UHA's main message is that oral health is key to overall health and well-being and that we need to ensure that vulnerable Ontario residents of all ages have access to oral health care. We plan to do this hopefully by extending dental programs to include low-income adults and seniors. This should not only include dental treatment but also prevention since according to the Canadian Dental Association, seven out of 10 Canadians will develop gum disease of some form at some time in their life. Doing this by expanding the existing public dental programs or investing in new infrastructure within community health centers, Aboriginal health access centers, and public health units, including mobile using mobile dental buses to ensure access to vulnerable people in every community in Ontario. We don't want government to just rely only on the private dentist to deliver public dental programs because it doesn't work for everyone. UHA conducted a survey last summer of public health units and found that in communities across Ontario, many private dental practices will not accept adults who are on social assistance programs. We hear that many private dentists admit they are frustrated because low-income people cannot pay and are often missing appointments. And academic research has shown that most people living on low income prefer to be treated in public dental clinics where they are welcomed and valued and don't experience the stigma of their situation. UHA has presented a detailed version of this proposal to all three political parties which all received, who received it and they seemed receptive and very supportive. With just three weeks before the Ontario provincial election, all of the three major parties have made some kind of a commitment related to expanding dental benefits. We can't remember a time when dental care was a hot, as hot of an election topic in Ontario. In its 2018 budget, the current Liberal government has promised up to $400 per person per year for dental care and drug benefits. The PC party recently, last Saturday, announced its plan to provide a dental program for low-income seniors and make investments in public health units, community health centers, and Aboriginal health access centers so they can expand their ability to deliver or begin delivering dental services and invest in mobile dental buses to service rural areas, quoting many aspects of UHA's low-income dental proposal. The NDPs have also used UHA's costs and figures and research on the topic to develop their promise for a dental program for all Ontarians. In preparation for the election on June 7th, UHA has created a one-page election ask for members to use when talking to local candidates about this issue. 
We are recommending that our members and anyone interested in this issue share this one pager with their community partners and friends, take it to meetings, write letters to the editor, share local stories, attend all candidates' meetings, and talk to local candidates about the connection between oral health and falls in the elderly, and ask for more information about how their party plans to um, address the gap in access to dental care in Ontario for adults and seniors. Please visit our website for more information and advocacy-related resources on access to dental care, and feel free to email me directly if you have any questions at all or would like to receive regular updates from UHA. My email will be included on our last slide. So why are we doing this? I'm 45, I really need help with dental. All of my teeth are decayed and I'm in pain all the time. Currently, I have no income. I think, I think the mess my teeth are in holds me back from obtaining employment. I've always worked in the retail field and I think people judge me because of my teeth. I would appreciate any help you have to offer. How do you respond to that when you know there's nothing out there? So because of this, as we mentioned, UHA was formed and this is one of the main reasons we are working towards are resolving this issue. Anna responds to each email that she receives and refers them to UHA partners, typically public health or community health center staff, who hopefully will be able to help connect the person with someone in their community to help them get the care they need until the current system changes. Whether it be a low-cost dental clinic at a CHC or public health unit, whether it be a dentist that offers lower rates or will do pro bono work, or a church or nonprofit group that has a pot of money that they can offer people for things like dental care. Unfortunately, there are times when there's absolutely nowhere to refer the client in their community and they have no other choice but to visit the doctor or go to their ER. So why are we doing this and asking you to join us? Well, this is a, one of a postcard campaign we had that uh, are pictures of real Ontario residents who are living with pain and infection. And in the center is Chantel, and this is why we are so pleased to be able to do this, because this is Chantel before and after receiving dental treatment. She feels so much better about herself. She was able to get off Ontario Works, and the only comment she had about it as well was that she says her cheeks still hurt but from smiling so much. But just as a note of interest, at a recent, this was about four years ago that Chantel had all of her dental treatment done, and at the March Symposium at Queen's Park, Chantel was there, and I got to chat with her. And she did make the comment that as thrilled as she was to get the dental treatment, because she can't afford to go all the time to the dentist, or as often as required, that she is starting to experience some problems again. So again, we can't stress enough, while the dental treatment is so important, prevention is as necessary as well. So this is why we are doing this, because there are many, many more Chantels in our community and province who need our voice. Marguerite? Nourishing food and to take pleasure in it is one of the few joys left as one ages. The well-fed and motivated older adult is much more apt to have fewer fall risks. We need to help get the message out. We need to create affordable dental care and to make effective oral care an everyday happening for our older adults. Two of the things in particular with older adults are accessible dental offices. We had made appointments for my mom at the point where she needed a full denture, called an office to see that it was accessible and they told us it was. But uh, the outside ramp was very steep, very difficult, and she was very frail, difficult to move. We get into the office, and to try to get a person from the wheelchair into the dental chair with the size of it was really quite an athletic feat, and uh, that just really shouldn't happen. And the other big thing is to have more time for the PSWs to give that care to our dear souls who are in long-term care. So there's many things we have to work on, but by working together, we can improve the oral health and the overall health of all Ontarians. Sarah? 
So we thank you for your time, and please let us know of any of your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marguerite. I'm going to open it now to our participants. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to type in the chat box, and we will read your questions aloud for the, present, for the presenters to hear, and they will be able to respond. Alternatively, you can also dial star 7 on your phone to unmute um, if you would like to ask your question in person. So there is um, one comment I see in the uh, chat box by Emily Powell. Um, great presentation. I would love to see the before and after on the brochure. And Anna and Sue, I will unmute you now, and you can speak to that. Uh, yeah, thank you for that, and uh, that's a great point. Um, our wish, if, well, if, if it could come true, is we could disband UHA and never have to worry about this again. But in reality, that's a great point. Yes, it's the pictures that make a, the difference, um, very compelling, and it's the, um, the human, the true stories of people, lived lives experience, which is the most compelling. I mean, we can throw numbers around as much as we want. They help, but it's still this. So a very good point, Emily. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sue, for responding. I have another comment from Ashley Fox. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Very excited to see what the government is taking, that the government is taking oral care seriously. I see a lot of cellulitis in the community, as you mentioned in the presentation. It, Sue, again, that's interesting. And I, just as an aside, I wasn't sure how it would be for time, but I was with my husband when we were in the emergency room um, getting treatment for his leg. And, yes, I, you know, I, we thought it might be something, not being a, a nurse, you know, dental, it was obviously the cell, cellulitis. But just happened to be that in the emergency room um, where we were, there was a uh, – a curtain divider, so there's not a lot of privacy, but the doctor that came in to look at a person in another chair in that room, he, the gentleman was in because he had an oral issue. I'm not sure if it was an abscess or gum disease or whatever, but here my husband is getting all this IV antibiotics and treatment, and the doctor just said to the uh, gentleman was basically, no, you have to go see your doctor. I could maybe give you an antibiotic, maybe painkillers, but it was just, again, just hit home how much the difference is in our system. So thank you for that. Hi, and it's Marguerite here. I did the poll at the beginning to see how many people made the connection between good oral health and preventing falls and how many felt that other health care workers might not be as tuned into that. Could we get some comments in, in the chat box there? Let us know if we have... Um, given you some resources to help you convince others, or if maybe you've had a change of mind yourself. We'd love to hear some of those comments. And as some of those comments come in, um, there is a question from Matt. Do you have fact sheets or infographics that we can share with our local physicians? Hi, Matt. Um, it's Anna, and I'm, I assume you're talking about um, fact sheets that link um, falls and oral health, um, and we we don't have anything like that created right now, but that might be, you know, something interesting to work with Marguerite um, and the Loop community on um, for the, you know, near future, because it's a very interesting new link for for us, even working in oral health for a, a while um, we haven't really raised that connection yet. But as for fact sheets, just for the rest of the group um, around um, around the access to dental care issue in, in Ontario, um, please, I urge you to visit our um, UHA webpage, and the link is included in um, in the presentation slides, uh, where you can find more information and fact, fact sheets and resources that you can print off, including that one pager that I, you know, again, we really urge you to share with community members and local candidate dates in the next um, few weeks before the election. And the the uh, postcards of Chantel. We had those um, printed back in 2012, and I think we're. We're just about at the last of our, um, like we, we didn't produce any more after that, but we did produce many, like thousands and thousands, and we have kept 
Um, I think there's some communities that are still giving them out, but we don't have any more of those exact postcards. But again, that's something that you know we can always look at to um, you know to rejuvenate if there's a if there's an interest there. And they may be available at some of the public health units because I was at an event last year and that was where I got to pick up some of the postcards and share them. Yeah, absolutely. There, I know that I did. That a few got in touch with me last year, and we were able to find a batch in various places in the community and send them off. I, I think Durham Region was one example of a of a health unit area that was still distributing them. And then I I had sent some out, probably in your area, Marguerite, and that's probably um, why you found them. It was actually the plowing match in. Uh in Huron County. Yes, yes. Okay. Now, I, I, I think um, I spoke to um, the hygienist at the health unit that was dealing with, or that was coordinating that um, activity. So, And in, in uh, a week or so, when everybody gets all the slides, you will have all the information on the slides that was presented today. Absolutely, yeah. We have been working on this a long time. Um, the Ontario Oral Health uh, uh, association is very keen. I've been very keen and I felt like sometimes we're voices crying in the wilderness, but as you were saying, it, it is a hot topic now. Now people are finally starting to listen. Great. Thank you, Marguerite and Anna. Um, there is one more question from Anne-Marie Koenigan. Chantelle is a great example of an individual who needs follow-up preventive care. Are you able to add the community clinics and dental hygiene programs to your list of resources who can provide that preventive slash maintenance care? Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, and that's a very good point. And I think UHA's um, vision is that hygiene programs or independent hygienists, I think that's what you mean by that, um, would be included um, in, in sort of the group of uh, care providers that are able to provide um, programs to adults as we, ex as we hope that things expand for adults in the future. So definitely we hope, you know, we, we would include them as the group of, you know, dental care professionals that would be um, helping out those in, in Ontario that don't currently have the ability to, to go and get such care. And Sue here, and just to say as well, what Anna just mentioned is to allow people to have a, a options and choices as to where they do want to receive their oral care and uh, what they're finding most comfortable. Wonderful. Thank you, Anna and Sue. Uh, we have a Another comment just from Emily Powell, a reminder to think about the issue um, when you think about where you cast your vote. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Absolutely, Emily. Thank you for that. And just a reminder, November is Fall Prevention Month. That's coming up um, quickly. Time to start doing planning for it. And last year uh, we were hoping that we would have some oral care programs for older adults with the dental hygienist program. And unfortunately, with the colleges being on strike at that time, they, they, they could not do it. But November is Fall Prevention Month coming up. Just a little extra incentive to look at great oral care for our older adults. Great. Thank you for the reminder, Marguerite. If there are any more questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box. We can give it another uh, minute or so in case anybody is still typing their question. But in the meantime, I would like to thank our presenters, Marguerite, Anna, and Sue, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm sure that there are many people out there who don't consider the link between oral health and falls, but. Uh, we all know that the issue of falls is so much multifactorial, and it was great to hear that you make all of those um, links and those connections in your presentation today. And I'm just going to advance the slide here um, 
to our Loop platform. And just a reminder to everybody, if you didn't receive the, um, the invitation to this webinar today through our Loop newsletter, please feel free to check out our website. It is a communication platform for anybody who is interested in fall prevention. The website is on your screen there, www.fallsloop.com. And we have a number of different services that we offer. Um, it's a great communication platform for you to search uh, over 2,000 members who are interested in fall prevention. Uh, we have private group functions that allow you to collaborate on different projects. And we are also launching our uh, new Knowledge Center tomorrow. Um, and that will be a way for um, anybody to have uh, free access to a knowledge broker. And, um, somebody who can help answer your questions and help uh, with some research uh, to advise your work. Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions, any more questions in the comment section. Um, so I think we can adjourn uh, a little bit early today. Uh, so thank you to all of our participants for joining us, engaging in a great discussion. Uh, please don't close the window just yet. Wait until you have been redirected to the next screen where a brief evaluation survey will launch in your browser. We'd really appreciate it if you could provide us some feedback so that we can continue to offer high quality webinars. So thank you to you all and have a wonderful day. See you next time. Thank you.